let's let's go on to the uh, a PCOS just diagnosed in a fertility clinic. She's come for infertility. She just diagnosed as polycystic ovaries. Uh, what should be the first rule? Should we just uh, start metformin for everybody just to optimize them and then give ovulation induction, or should we select our clients on and what criteria we would base that decision on? Well, there's no doubt that the most effective treatment it remains clomiphene citrate. And I, I remember you, you mentioning about uh, metformin in lean as well as in obese. Yes, there, there is good uh, literature on the effectiveness in a lean oligomenorrheic woman. Um, then it, it's um, hard to quantify from the literature how effective it is in that group. If it, but I think that, so the same rule applies. If you really want to get pregnant in the next few months, it's clomid every time. If you're someone, and I see quite a number of these women, you may too, um, where they're, they're sensibly pregnancy planning. They yeah, may want yeah. to be pregnant in a year's time. Um, but they want to make sure everything's in place. Yeah. So we may check their AMH, we may look at their ultrasound uh, and see is there any reason why they should not go earlier. Yeah. But they're oligomenorrheic. So for that person, metformin I use um, because there is a chance that they, it would be, it, um, there is good data to say it improves your ovulation rate. So even though the data says it doesn't improve live birth rate, um, it is on the long-term use, it probably is effective. There's a lot of discussion going on, especially in Indian gynecologists, about doing insulin levels or, or doing an insulin and glucose ratios and establish that there is a hyperinsulinemia yeah. uh, or a metabolic syndrome <coughs> before you kick off with the metformin prescription. Should we really follow that so strictly? Well, the data says that insulin or insulin sensitivity markers are not a great predictor of your effectiveness with metformin. So I, t I run the rule of um, uh, prescribing metformin in the appropriate case for oligomenorrhea with no biochemical distinction because I don't think it's, it, it, it is slightly suggestive of who's going to respond. But um, the, the sensitivity and specificity of the insulin test is so poor, it would never alter my management plan. Actually, I remember one of your earlier uh, publications which talked about the number of cycles per year and hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance. They are, are related. Could, if you could just uh, <coughs> tell me about that, that particular study. Which so there is a, a linear correlation and it's to do with the, the um, severity of your PCOS. So there's a linear correlation between the number of menstrual cycles per year and your fasting insulin level. And that's been shown in several studies. Um, so insulin is a marker of a degree of oligomenorrhea, but there's quite a lot of noise around that, that correlation coefficient. So although it, it is an association that shows that um, insulin is driving the ovary, that, that's why that's an interesting uh, correlation. <coughs> the mechanism being that insulin acting as a cogonadotrophin is raising the intra-ovarian testosterone. Okay. That's the drive to oligomenorrhea. And therefore if you lower insulin, and metformin does do that, um, all of the meta-analyses show that your menstrual cycle does get shorter yeah. and your ovulation rate improves. So there's nothing wrong, you would say, nothing wrong in giving a try with metformin for three to six months and if looking have, at whether the cycles, if she's if not taking an time, immediate yeah. fertility. And I think the error is to pretend yeah. it's a really effective short-term treatment. Uh, but of course, the, the data that says that Clomid is better, um, the, the biggest trial, the Rick Legros yeah. study, yeah, it's, it's a nine-month study. Yeah. So if you want to know, in a way that study was saying, which is the fastest way to get pregnant? Well, yeah. clomid is faster than metformin. No doubt. Yeah. doesn't mean metformin is mm -hmm. not no effective. Doubt, yeah. I often have a wonder, if you did a study over two years, yeah. uh, would the lines eventually meet that metformin yeah, caught up so. in the end? Because some of them would have become more regular. And, and from the pregnancy outcome and from the live birth uh, part of uh, the discussion, Probably metformin has its own role in adjusting the metabolic syndrome and giving a better live birth and decreasing the recurrent pregnancy losses. Uh, yes, could be. And Clomid getting a pregnancy. That. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, so. and then they were, those weren't outcomes of the studies. Yeah. So although we all took home the message of a strong negative against metformin, yeah. um, it was a particular situation, which was the speed of achieving a pregnancy over a nine-month right, right, time. Right. Yeah. And uh, when you apply that uh, this hyperinsulinemia data to the Indian population from your Kolhapur based study, how do you uh, correlate things and what, what interesting findings you thought were there in the study here? Um, the, um, the ethnicity of the South Indian population, the whole of South Asia, 
um, is one of insulin resistance and a high risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, and I must admit, I expected to see that to be very prominent in the Colopore study, where we had over 700 women with PCO. Um, and interestingly enough, against a reference group, insulin wasn't that prominent. Yeah. But I think the explanation is uh, that the BMI distribution of a very broad population, including rural women, is, is much lower yeah, than in the true, Western true. population. So the BMI yeah. <coughs> of the study of you know, Kolopor women um, went right down to 16. Well, that's unheard of yeah. in the States or in... Uh, yeah, many of them will interpret a hypothalamic amenorrhea. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's uh, but they clearly did. Yeah. They had high LH, they had PCO, oh, yeah. um, but it is operating at a whole yeah. different BMI range. Yeah. Now, uh, let me just take you to the thyroid uh, yeah. queries which we have. Uh, how strict and is it necessary to be very strict as far as the TSH levels, maintaining it less than three pre-pregnancy and during the course of pregnancy is concerned uh, from the uh, preterm labor point of view and the fertility point of view? Um, and the history to this is, is uh, as follows. Um, the, the intervention, it's long been known that a TSH above 2.5 um, in all populations is associated with a higher risk of miscarriage. The difficulty comes is we only have one good intervention study, and it's a small one, and is now quite old, nearly 10 years old, that said that if you gave thyroxine to the high-risk group of women, actually that group of women had higher thyroid autoantibodies, <coughs> then you lower the miscarriage risk and you lower the preterm delivery. The difficulty is it hasn't been replicated. And I think the reason why people are now questioning that uh, data is that had it been a really robust finding, I, I think it would have been replicated by now. We would have yeah. seen many more intervention studies. There are three being published next year. Um, one coming from the, state, from the UK, which is a tablet study, one coming from the United States, and one coming from the Netherlands. And these are big studies, but the very fact it's taken huge studies to verify it says to me that I think the TSH effect is very slight okay. um, and was probably exaggerated. Like a lot of these things, oh. when, the, when the first comes out, we think this is going to be the most important thing out. And then as time passes, the data settles into the textbooks and we mm -hmm. think, actually, that didn't really amount to much. I think we're in the cynical phase at the moment. It, it, may be, it may be corrected as we get the new studies out. So we're in a limbo time where we have uh, circumstantial data to say thyroxine, low TSH is good, um, but we have a little suspicion in the background that it's, the impact is not as big as we first thought. Here in India, we get a large population where the TSH is between 4 to 6, but TPO negative. Yeah. And we are in dilemma whether one is, should we treat or should we not? And secondly, uh, sh uh, how, how long should we offer them the ultroxin yes. treatment? Uh, well, I share the predicament. I think we're probably over-treating a lot of women, um, both in pre-pregnancy and during pregnancy. Um, we only still have this one study to go by. Um, the flip side of it, though, is um, as long as you don't over-treat, um, it, it's, it's a safe and effective treatment. I, I do, there are a lot of, lot of people are coming out with criticisms of the over-treatment of thyroid problems in pregnancy. But I can't see there's a negative side. So while we're in this limbo time, um, I have been in favor of reducing TSH. And don't forget, in the first trimester, it goes down quite low. Yeah. Um, but then easing off after the first trimester, because it's normal to have a two TSH of two or three yeah. in the last trimester. Um, and then pulling back, just to make sure you're not over-treating the fetus. So I would, um, that, that's been my policy, is I, while we're waiting for better evidence, um, I do suppress TSH to below 2.5 prior to pregnancy, particularly those with thyroid autoantibodies, but also without, accepting we have no data for the thyroid, yeah. negative, thyroid antibody negative, um, and then carry on at least through the first trimester. Once you're in pregnancy, I don't usually stop completely, but I do allow the TSH to rise. Okay. So I'll be measuring the TSH at least every trimester. Okay. And, and it's said uh, many a times the patient has taken, the couple has taken multiple fertility treatment and one of the fertility treatment clicks and they achieve pregnancy. Over a period of these, let's say, treatments of three or four months, uh, the TSH might not have been repeated. Yes. And because of hyper estrogenism, 
the TSS is bound to rise. Yes. And by the time they enter pregnancy, they enter pregnancy with a little higher TSS, which was not there earlier. Yep, yep, I agree. Uh, then how, how do we deal with this situation? Or should we electively do a TSH again? No, you, that, you, that's a big you, you've got exactly my experience and predicament. Uh, because the, res the data is on a single measurement. Yeah. Um, and so a single measurement was taken and then they a decision yeah. to treat. <coughs> and the association studies are on a single measurement. So we don't know what happens to that group of women who appear to fluctuate or who go from one to three. Um, and of course, as everybody's focused in this area, they're getting more measurements. So we're picking up noise. My hunch is we're picking up irrelevant noise. Um, but on the other hand, um, we're in this still a time when we don't know what that three means. Um, I will often treat, um, even in that situation. So I'm fairly relaxed about treating. But I think one has to be very clear that we have so limited good evidence. So I, th I think if, the, if there's an infertility conception after super ovulation, better to do a TSH and control it. And, and, and I do do today, it. And today, I, I think super ovulation up. affects it in some women. Yeah. I think the drug treatment does. And I, my other message to the women I see in clinic is to have a measurement in, as soon as pregnancy is diagnosed, no, within, a, yeah. within a week or two. Because the requirement for thyroxine goes up anyway in pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. And in some people, it appears to go up very early. Now, we don't know whether that is related to miscarriage, miscarriage. risk, um, the early takeoff in pregnancy. And so um, I, I think we may have generated for ourselves a lot of work well. um, with very poor evidence that we're doing anything. We raise a little bit of anxiety. Um, but at the moment, I feel it's simple treatment, it's safe treatment. Um, and until we have better data, I'm erring on the side of treatment. Well, thank you so much, Jerry, for all your contribution. Thank you. Thank you.